50 years ago this week, President John F. Kennedy was assassinated. This is Walter Cronkite Guide in our newsroom, and there has been an attempt, as perhaps you know now, on the life of President Kennedy. A remarkable life ended in an instant for a man who came of age here in Connecticut. From his school years at Choate, to his campaign stop in Hartford, to his visits here as president. It is true and of high importance that the prosperity of this country depends on the assurance that all major elements within it will live up to their responsibilities. We will look back at John Kennedy's time in the Constitution State as Connecticut remembers JFK. All straight ahead on Face the State this Sunday, November 17th, 2013. This is Face the State with Dennis House, Connecticut's most watched local political program. Good morning and welcome to a special edition of Face the State. A half century ago, on November 22nd, 1963, Americans came together in shock, disbelief, and grief after one of the most traumatic events in our nation's history. In fact, in world history. The assassination of President John Kennedy was a pain felt deeply here in Connecticut because of the young president's many ties here. In the next half hour, we will have some rare old film of Kennedy in our state. We'll talk with people who are preserving his legacy, including Connecticut's very own Kennedy and the local politicians who followed his lead, one of whom met with the president just a month before he was killed. First, though, Kennedy's childhood here. He came to our state at the age of 13 to attend the Canterbury School, a boarding school in New Milford. And here's a young Jack Kennedy with his father and brother Joe. One of his report cards is on display right now at the Kennedy Library in Boston. Kennedy developed appendicitis there, went home to recover, and never returned. In the fall of 1931, his parents sent him to Choate in Wallingford. Well, we are in the Kennedy Room in the, in the basement of the Andrew Mellon Library. It uh, has a collection of many books about uh, Kennedy, and it also really shows the beginning of the school archive, because after the assassination, there was a decision at school that it was time that, that the school really had a, a professional school archive. And it began, in part, with a collection of magazines uh, and newspaper coverage of the assassination. At John Kennedy's alma mater, Choate Rosemary Hall, every student and faculty member knows of its most famous alumnus. The students knew what rooms he lived in when he was here, you know, they, uh, they knew a great deal about him. I'm not sure that intensified their, their grief, but it was certainly strong. It was the Choate School back then, and all boys, when Jack Kennedy enrolled in 1931. Well, he came here uh, as a freshman. Uh, his brother, his older brother, was already here, uh, Joe Jr. And uh, he, and Joe Jr. Um, was somewhat of a superstar here. And so young Jack had a difficult time uh, trying to live up to that role model. So he tended to take a different path, as any younger brother might, um, to carve his own uh, identity here and not be the great sports star. Choate archivist Judy Donald has researched Kennedy's high school education. Over his four, the course of the four years here, teachers recognized that he had the academic talent, but he didn't uh, work at it hard enough. Kennedy was an avid writer and wrote to his parents often. In this letter, he's asking his mother to make him the godfather to his newborn brother, Teddy. When he wasn't writing and studying, young Jack was occasionally in trouble. He had other tricks up his sleeve that would annoy the headmaster no end. But, uh, and at one point, yes indeed, his father had to be called in to, to make sure that uh, Jack could continue here and actually graduate. This building here is simply called Archbald, home to the administration and the admissions department. But back in the 1930s, it was home to the school infirmary, and the future president spent quite a bit of time here. In fact, his various illnesses profoundly impacted his life on campus. Well, he was an earnest athlete, but he was also um, uh, not, not physically well a lot of the time that he was here, during the years he was here. So he couldn't participate in varsity sports. Uh, he just wasn't physically able. Uh, spirit was willing. Um, and uh, academically, uh, not a stellar student, but the teachers recognized that he had the talent. He just didn't apply himself. So he wasn't a great athlete, wasn't a great student. Why did people vote him to be most likely to succeed? 
because he had a great talent for friendship. And uh, he had his own group of friends, but I think, um, I think others recognized there was a spark in him. There was something that was worth voting for in that particular election. Our thanks to Tom Yankis, a teacher at Choate, and Judy Donald, the archivist there. 20 years after Choate, Kennedy was a U.S. senator and came to Connecticut from time to time, particularly in the late 1950s. His good friend John Bailey was the chairman of the state Democratic Party and would later run the National Party. Bailey played a major role in Kennedy's run for president in 1960 and his brief candidacy for vice president in 1956. Bailey's daughter, Barbara Kennelly, who was later elected to Congress, remembers Kennedy very well. Mrs. Kennelly, tell me the first day you met John Kennedy. Oh, I met him a number of times between the time he uh, got the nomination in uh, a convention four years earlier. And then, of course, my father was very, very close with him planning the next election. It almost began immediately after the 56 uh, convention. When you first saw him for the first time, did you think there was something special about him? That this well, there man was. Might... There was. Uh, you have a picture I gave you. Uh, he spoke at my graduation. And, uh, well, of course, my father got him to speak at my graduation. <laughs> and that was 58. And then we all got friendly. So he would come to Hartford on a fairly regular basis to see your dad. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, I gave you a picture of him in our living room on Scarborough Street. And uh, that day, uh, my father had a cocktail party for all his friends to meet Kennedy. And then uh, he took a nap upstairs. And then he was going over to have dinner with Abe Ribicoff. And he forgot his suit. So my husband, he couldn't, he couldn't be, oh, I'll take it, I'll take it. So he had an opportunity to go over and have a nice chat with him, really. Let's talk about election day, election night, 1960. He went to Waterbury, and then he went to Hartford. What was that like for you to be oh, there? So exciting. Oh, it was so exciting. And, you know, he didn't get to Waterbury till very late at night, and the crowd was just so enthusiastic. It was, it was, it was heavenly. What was he like as a person? Tell us something oh. we don't know about John F. Kennedy. He really uh, was special. I mean, he looked right at you. He didn't have any ears. He, he, he was, all the pictures you see of him and the talking, it was all him. He was, he was uh, very comfortable in his skin. When you look at that film, the old film of the Hartford Times building, yeah. it's remarkable. Number one, how many people were that close to him? And there were, there were thousands as far as the eye could see. Yeah. Where were you in that crowd? I was uh, on the balcony. My mother's right up front there. And, uh, <laughs> It wasn't exciting. It was an electric crowd. That's what it was. People, I think people just were so thrilled. And, uh, you know, there was a lot about him being the first uh, Catholic that was going to have a chance to win. And, you know, we've got a lot of Catholics <laughs> in Connecticut. So there was, a, there was extra excitement. After he was elected, you went to the White House with your daughter, your niece, mm -hmm. your sister? Mm -hmm. When was that? Oh, unfortunately, uh, that was the day, a month to the day before he was shot. What was that visit like? It, 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 we, were, we were going <coughs> to the um, Oval Office, and we weren't sure he was going to be there. And uh, so we were going in. My mother was with us. And uh, all of a sudden, he arrived. And you saw the pictures. And uh, he, he was so nice with the children. He was wonderful. When he would come to Hartford, would he stay overnight? Or would he just travel in and out? <laughs> no, he stayed that night at uh, Abe Ribicoff's, I believe, at the governor's house. When you look at that picture of your daughter and President Kennedy, what goes through your mind? How fortunate we were to know him. Now, the visit to Waterbury Mrs. Kennelly talked about was one for the history books, yet we've been unable to find any news film of it in our archives, except for this short film discovered by CPTV, shot by a man named Michael Lavignale. It shows Kennedy leaving the Immaculate Conception Church on November 6, 1960, and entering the Elton Hotel. The next day, with the historic election looming, Kennedy paid a visit to Hartford, and it, too, was very remarkable in terms of the enthusiasm this campaign stop generated. Congressman John Larson told me the nuns at his school even gave them all the day off so they could go watch the man who had become the first Catholic president. Channel 3, Hartford. Senator Kennedy came into downtown in a brand new Ford convertible by motorcade, surrounded by state police and Hartford police. Thousands of people waited in the cold, young and elderly, including several nuns. This film we have is silent, but you can just imagine the scene just by looking at the people's faces and the scores of people trying to get close to the candidate. 
The motorcade came right down Main Street past State House Square and ended at the Hartford Times building, where a crowd of thousands stretched from City Hall to the Traveler's Tower. A giant banner welcomed Kennedy to Hartford. Flanked by two of his sisters, Kennedy addressed his supporters, some of whom waited hours to get a glimpse of the man they hoped would be president. And then it was back to the motorcade, across the Connecticut River, the Founders Bridge, to East Hartford. Later, we will hear from the president's nephew, Ted Kennedy Jr., who lives right here in our state. Next, after John Kennedy was elected in 1960, he came here twice as president. And we'll take you back to those visits. John Kennedy only came to Connecticut twice as president, both times in 1962. The first was a trip to New Haven in June of that year, where this Harvard alumnus delivered the commencement address at his collegiate arch rival, Yale University. It might be said now that I have the best of both worlds, a Harvard education and a Yale degree. <laughs> I am particularly glad to become a Yale man because as I think about my troubles, I find that a lot of them have come from other Yale men. <laughs> it is true and of high importance that the prosperity of this country depends on the assurance that all major elements within it will live up to their responsibilities. If business were to neglect its obligations to the public, if labor were to be blind to all public responsibility, above all, if government were to abandon its obvious and statutory duty of watchful concern for our economic health, if any of these things should happen, then confidence might well be weakened and the danger of stagnation would increase. This is the true issue of confidence. If there is any current trend towards meeting present problems with old cliches, this is the moment to stop it before it lands us all in the bog of sterile acrimony. And just a few months later, on October 17, 1962, the president was back for a whirlwind campaign swing through Bridgeport, Waterbury, and New Haven for his good friend, Abe Ribicoff, who was running for the Senate seat, being vacated by Prescott Bush, the father and grandfather to future presidents. What is significant about this visit is that it happened during the Cuban Missile Crisis, and somehow Ribicoff convinced his good buddy to leave the White House even as the nation was on the verge of nuclear war and come to Connecticut to campaign. Governor Dempsey, Abe Ribicoff, Frank Lennon, Congressman John Monaghan, ladies and gentlemen, I want to express my thanks to all of you. I am uh, delighted to come back to this state, the state of Connecticut, under the leadership of Abe Ribicoff, was the first state of the union to support my candidacy for the presidency. It was the state that uh, placed us in nomination, and it was the first state to report its results in 1960. The fact of the matter is, in this city nearby of Bridgeport, since January 1961, unemployment has been reduced by 45%. And what is true of Bridgeport is true of the state of Connecticut. All these programs, however, whether they're minimum wage, whether the development of our space program, whether the development of our national defense, whether they are the development of our cities and towns, all these programs, need the effective commitment of men in the House and Senate. As Abe Ribicoff knows, we lost fight after fight on issue after issue in the House and Senate by one, two, three, or four votes. And we won fight after fight in the House and Senate by one, two, three, or four votes. We lost, as Abe knows, medical care for the aged by a change of one vote in the United States Senate. And that is the reason why I believe it's vitally important that this state send to Washington to serve with your distinguished Senator Tom Dodd, another great Democrat, Abe Ribicoff. From the airport, President Kennedy traveled by motorcade to Waterbury, where thousands 
lined the streets there. And after the Brass City, he headed to New Haven, where thousands waited for him on the green. I have come to this uh, center of learning in order... to come back to uh, my college, Yale. <laughs> and I have enjoyed that warm reception I've gotten from my fellow Eli's as I drove into this uh, city. <laughs> this country will spend more on its space program this year than all the eight years from 1953 to 1960. This administration, this administration and Congress has strengthened the military forces of the United States, has increased the combat divisions of the Army by five, the number of Polaris submarines by 50 percent, the number of bombers on the 15-minute alert by 50 percent, and has given the United States the strongest peacetime posture it has ever had in the last 21 months. Now, while we were doing this, what is the record of the Republicans? And I recommend in 1962 a program of progress for this country, and I hope we'll have a Democratic House and Senate that is so committed. And that's what we're meeting for tonight, and that's why we're going to be successful. Thank you. President Kennedy's last visit to our state in 1962. When we come back, we will talk with three local politicians inspired by President Kennedy and the man carrying on his legacy in this state. We'll be right back. The two priests who were with Kennedy say that he is dead of his bullet wounds. That seems to be about as close to official as we can get at this time. They w did see the president just a few moments ago, and this is the bulletin that has just cleared uh, from Dallas that the two priests who were in the emergency room where President Kennedy lay after being taken from the Dallas street corner where he was shot say that he is dead. Our man Dan Rather in Dallas reported that about 10 minutes ago too. The Friday before Thanksgiving 1963 was certainly the 9-11 of my parents generation. There isn't a person alive who was of age then who cannot remember where they were when they heard the news President Kennedy had been assassinated. I was walking across Harvard Yard in Cambridge when I first heard someone talking about President Kennedy being shot and of course couldn't believe it until I actually saw it on TV in a restaurant that was playing the preliminary news and I was shocked and just broken as I thought about what it meant to the nation. It was the first of any major assassination, others followed, that I lived through. And for someone at Harvard, someone whose political consciousness had been shaped by the Kennedy excitement and exuberance it was more than a shock, it was something very fundamental being shaken. And I remember feeling that the world had changed. The world changed on that day for me, as it changed for so many Americans. And something was shaken, something broken. The shock hit me as I thought about it, watching the TV, very small black and white TV, in that restaurant with a group of other people, some of them in tears. It still evokes the most powerful, powerful feelings. Uh, uh, JFK was someone that I was, I was in college. I was the, um, such a strong supporter. I campaigned for him. Uh, I, w I was at Marymount College in Tarrytown, New York, and uh, I campaigned for him, went to the teas that his family did. I think if you were to go back and talk to any of my classmates, you would find that they would have said that I was rabid about, uh, uh, about JFK. I was up the entire night waiting, for, you know, during election night to see him elected. I remember precisely where I was on that day. I was in Dr. Michael Zyke's history class when one of my roommates 
opened the door, she threw open the door, and she just looked at me and she said to me, Rosa, she said, they've killed the president. And it was stunning, just stunning. It's the power of that moment is something that I will never, ever forget. It was uh, six period and uh, Irene Bray, uh, who uh, came on the uh, speaker uh, and had said that the uh, president had been shot and uh, it was incomprehensible. Uh, nobody could make that connection. He was, he was too young, he was too youthful. At first it was thought that, what, um, President Eisenhower, some of four, and then not there long after as school was closing that he was, that he was gone, that he was dead. And uh, I can't think of uh, anything for my generation. I know for another generation it will be September the 11th and for the generation before us it was Pearl Harbor. But for us, uh, that moment and then the ensuing assassinations of Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy, uh, it seemed for a while this incredibly cruel crucible for a country that we were enmeshed in. Uh, and uh, that's how we came of age. Larson, DeLauro, Blumenthal, and many others went into politics because of President John F. Kennedy. At Choate, the school started a public affairs course after his death to encourage students to follow in Kennedy's footsteps. Kennedy's nephew, Ted Kennedy Jr., told me his uncle's legacy is indeed public service. Ted, as you look around the room, we see a lot of people who were inspired to go into public service because of your uncle, Senator Blumenthal, Congressman Larson. How does it make you feel that so many people followed his lead? Well, you know, Dennis, Every day I meet people who tell me that they were inspired by my uncle, President Kennedy, and I have to say how proud that makes me feel. Um, you know, I think that giving back and uh, uh, this, this spirit of making a contribution is part of our common humanity. And my uncle, Jack, was the very first national leader who told us that all of us can give back in a big or small way. Um, and, and that, in fact, it was our patriotic duty to do so. Uh, so I'm inspired by people when they tell me that my uncle had an influence on their life. You know, obviously he was from Massachusetts, loved in his home state, but Connecticut he's also loved. He spent a lot of time in his life here. Do you ever come across people who have met him here? Um, well, although he was from Massachusetts, he had a very special connection. Uh, with the people of Connecticut. You know that he had a long-standing friendship with the Bailey family and with the Rivikoffs, but he also formed special connections with the many people he met in Bridgeport and in New Haven, and especially that night on election evening in Waterbury, which was a night that was an emotional experience for him, which he will never forget. You know, one thing that is coming out of this year is that young people learning about President Kennedy some of them for the first time, so sort of what he did, his accomplishments. How does that make you feel? Well, I think that in many ways, the reason why we're still talking about President Kennedy is not just because he was an incredible person, which he was, but it's what he stood for, which is fairness. And as I mentioned before, giving back, that all of us can give back in our own way. Four schools were named after Kennedy after he was assassinated, one of them in Waterbury. We thank you for watching this Sunday morning. We leave you with Kennedy's visit to our capital city the day before he was elected our nation's 35th president.